All right, good morning. Um, everybody, before he leaves the stage, I want to give you all a chance to thank our special guest all the way from Corpus Christi. This is Ryan, and he's here leading in Nathan's absence today. He crushed it. Thank you so much. All right. Can y'all hear me? All right. That's good. Because I can't hear you, because I am temporarily deaf, and this is a true story. I didn't know this was going to happen, but I've been sick for a while. I went to the CVS uh, nurse practitioner person, who I'm sure is perfectly good at her job, but she did not tell me about some side effects of this medicine she gave me, <laughs> uh, and I've had two distinct weird side effects. The first is uh, hallucinations, and the second is hearing loss, temporary hearing loss. So I have no idea how good that guy really was. I assume he's good. <laughs> I can see you laughing. I can't hear it. You might be yelling at me. I'm not sure. Just nod your head a lot today as I'm talking, okay? I appreciate that. It's been, it's been a really interesting week. Bronchitis is the diagnosis. I'm not contagious, so don't worry. You're sitting on the front. Uh, I'm not going to get you sick. Uh, but it takes three weeks to run its course. And of course, I got it during Easter, which made life fun uh, for all of us, especially for Giovanna. She is loving me right now. Uh, sick Eric is the best Eric. Not really. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm a very bad patient. Um, I know bronchitis is not the worst thing in the world, except when I have it, in which case it is <laughs> the worst thing you can possibly suffer through. Uh, but I think it's about done, so... Only problem is I can't hear, and I don't know what Abraham Lincoln's trying to tell me. Uh, if you, anyway, that was a hallucination joke. Are you laughing right now? It's not. Okay, thank you. So, welcome to the story. My name's Eric. Welcome to the all that are joining us online. Thank you for being here. We did have just an incredible weekend last weekend, starting Thursday night through Sunday night. Um, Easter weekend was just crazy. Like we had eight services. Um, the total count was over 2,000 people at these services. It was our biggest Easter ever. And um, the really good part about that for me is that the resurrection is what we came to, to celebrate and to learn more about. And the resurrection in the Christian worldview is by far the most important event in history. Everything else we believe as Christians hinges on whether or not the tomb of Jesus was really, truly, bodily empty. And if it wasn't, then we can all do something else with our Sunday mornings. And I mean this truly, myself included, I need to find another job if anybody knows of anything. Like if the body was still in the tomb, then nothing else about Christianity's truth claims makes any sense at all. Now if it was empty, everything should change. It was, a, it was a, a signal to all of humanity that God is real, that Jesus is God, that forgiveness is, uh, is true and available to all, like, and, and death doesn't win. Like, those are pretty important messages that were sent if Easter is real. And so we got together with 2,000 people at all these services to, to learn more about that. And on Thursday night in particular, I spoke a lot about my experience in the Holy Land and the things I learned about the crucifixion, the actual event of Jesus' death and the resurrection um, on Sunday. And, and somebody mentioned, or a couple people wrote notes and said, hey, if you ever have a trip that you're leading to the Holy Land, we hope you'll tell us because we want to know what you know about this. We want to see what you've seen. And, and um, I, I want to make sure everybody knows we have a trip already planned. It's in January of 2020. There's still time to sign up. In fact, the deposit isn't due until August, but we do encourage people who think you're going to go to get signed up as soon as possible because there will be a max we reach. We don't want like 200 people going. I don't want to be in charge of that many people uh, in the Holy Land. So, um, you know, we'll have a couple of buses, and, and once we fill those up, that's going to be that. I know not everyone can go because it's January. So teachers and students, accept my apologies. We had to schedule it for some time. And January is the cheapest month to go to the Holy Land. So we'll do the summer next time, all right? And y'all can pay it with those fat teacher salaries. <laughs> Are you laughing right now? I can't tell. Yeah. Everybody but the teachers. <laughs> uh, and so we, we will uh, try to, if we do another one, we'll try to schedule it at a time that other people can go. But this is our first shot at this. I'd love to, to see you all there. I had my own conversion moment uh, in the Holy Land. It was in February of 2013 that I actually accepted 
the truth of Christianity and internalized it as my own truth. Um, so it wasn't that long ago, even though before that, I had always gone through the motions of Christianity. I was a pastor before I was really a believing Christian. And I think that is uh, just part of my story. And, and um, ever since that time, I've come back to real life in America, and I have been obsessed with the ongoing debate or conversation between really, really smart Christians and really, really smart atheists or non-Christians about the merits of the Christian truth claims. And so I will just stream one uh, debate after another on YouTube um, as I'm doing the dishes or just around the house. It's just one of my favorite things to do. And there's one debate in particular that I go back to quite often. And I am not proud to admit the reasons why. I go back to this one a lot because it's like the junk food of these debates because for Christians like me, this is that debate where the Christian guy, it's not even a fair fight, like he just mops the floor with this atheist guy. And I know it's not Christian of me to like that, but I really like it, <laughs> like the worst parts of me. Really, and I know I'm not alone because the channel where I found this clip you're about to see is a Christian YouTube channel called Apologetics Thug Life, and they compile all the examples of when this happens, and so I'm not the only one, but I know I've got work to do. This clip uh, features two actually local brilliant people, and the first one is a, a philosophy professor at Houston Baptist. He's from the Christian point of view, William Lane Craig, and then there is a guy named uh, Parsons. I almost said Jim Parsons. That's not him. Jim Parsons is a guy from TV, right? <laughs> Keith, I think it's Keith Parsons, who is in the University of Houston system, also a PhD and a philosophy professor. And they're talking about the merits of this claim of resurrection. And Parsons, kind of, he's coming from the secular humanist worldview, and he goes one argument after another, and William Lane Craig, who is the best of the best at this, he kind of just chips away at one argument after another. So Parsons is left with this hallucination theory uh, that you're gonna hear in a minute. He thinks that maybe the, the disciples who saw the risen Jesus actually thought they did, but they really didn't. Anyway, this is three minutes of pure bliss for me. Enjoy this, uh, this clip of this debate. Okay, now, as for the experiences, the appearances of Jesus, Dr. Craig said that I deny these. I do not. I do not deny that the disciples had an experience which they interpreted, which they took as being an appearance of Jesus. I think they probably did. Well, how do we account for that? How, how can we say that they could possibly have had such an, an experience? Well, once again, he very far too quickly and dismissively uh, disregards the uh, explanation of hallucinations. I was just simply reading the Encyclopedia of Psychology recently. It says that one-eighth to two-thirds of normal human beings experience waking hallucinations. Now, one of the standard characteristics of many hallucinations is that they seem extremely real. So, very many of these experiences, which occur, as I say, to a very considerable segment of the population, seem extremely real at the time. These cases have to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Of you course. can't dismiss the resurrection narratives on the basis that some other spurious miracle stories have occurred. You have to assess each one on its own merits. And what I fear from your response is that this watchword, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, is really just an excuse for an a priori rejection of the miraculous, because you, you, weren't, or you didn't give any sort of evidence that would satisfy you with respect to one of these extraordinary claims. It made it sound like, to me, you were saying, that nothing would convince you, oh, no matter no, what. No, all sorts of things would convince me. Well, with respect to the resurrection, though. I mean, you even you said if there was a video camera, you'd say it was a fake stone that was mm. rolled away. You know, I mean, mm. what, what sort of... That what would be, sort the, of, would be the more reasonable hypothesis under the but, circumstances. Well, but see, that's what I fear. It is. It's, uh -huh. just an, it's just an a priori rejection of the miraculous here. You're, you're not... There isn't any kind of literary testimony, historical testimony that mm -hmm. could convince you. So once again, these extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence in no way implies a bias against the supernatural. It's well, simply, it's sim it's simply uh, an application of a rule which we use in our daily lives. But, but you're saying that these, when you say extraordinary, really what you're saying is no amount of evidence would co convince me of these extraordinary claims. Sure it would. If uh, tomorrow morning, immediately after breakfast, 
Suddenly there was an earthquake, you know, and a silvery light shone in the sky and the leaves dropped from the trees. And I dashed outside and there towering over us like a hundred Everest was this giant figure with lightning playing around his Michelangeloid face. And he pointed down and saying, be assured, Keith M. Parsons, that I do in fact exist and I'm sick of your logic chopping. Uh, Dr. Craig, I would join you in the pew of the church, in the you, front pew of the church the next Sunday. Yeah, you, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know. Be going to the question and answer period. We're going to go to the question and answer period, so we'll be going you, to the microphone you, as we you wind don't this think, down. You don't think that you would have said, oh, I was having a hallucination. <laughs> <laughs> Apologetic thug life. There it is. Uh, <laughs> I'm not proud of it. Um, but I, I love this particular debate in this particular clip. Uh, I know that not all uh, atheists or unbelievers are that far out of their depth as this guy was with uh, William Lane Craig. But there is today, a, a, I think, a contingent in, in a population, even in our culture today, that rejects um, certain claims on an a priori basis. You heard him say a priori. That means without really considering the evidence you just reject it based on your own preconceived philosophy or worldview of how, how things work. And so there's a little bit of, uh, uh, I think, an uphill climb for Christians to communicate our uh, view of the world and our, what we understand to be true to people who see things that way. And the only reason I want to mention this for today's purposes is I want you to know that if it's ever felt like you couldn't quite effectively articulate your beliefs as a Christian, or if you're not a Christian and it always has felt like Christians couldn't quite convince you with enough evidence of Christian truth, this conversation is not new. And it's been going on for 2,000 years, since the beginning of the church. And in this series called Keep Jesus Weird, we're in part four, we're looking at the first eight chapters of this book in the New Testament called the Book of Acts, or the Acts of the Apostles, that really documents with extreme detail and vivid detail the, 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 uh, research, or the uh, growth, the explosion of Christianity in the weeks, not years, weeks following the resurrection of Jesus. And, and what we see in the early parts of Acts is that Christian, the very first Christians had to explain themselves to an unbelieving public, and an occasionally hostile public. They had to clearly, concisely, courageously articulate why they believed these extraordinary truth claims put forth by Christianity. And, uh, and they, had, they had to do so, especially we'll see in, in Acts chapter 4 today. Um, what, what I want you to know before we get into today's passage and the arguments being made is that right before this, in Acts 3, the two key figures, Peter and John, who were inside circle guys in Jesus' ministry, they have healed a guy. And it wasn't just a nobody. Like, they healed a guy that everybody knew needed healing. He had never walked and every day he was lifted up by his friends and dropped down at the temple gate, the same gate, the same entrance to the temple. Everybody walked past this guy for years, including Jesus probably, who walked past this guy when he entered the temple and knew this guy. Everybody knew him. And the fact that this guy that everybody knew had never walked a step in his life was now healed, this was a problem for the opponents of early Christianity. And you're gonna see some of that, um, that, that anger and that, that bubbling up in the surface in this reading from Acts 4. Let's look at the first four verses. You've got a study guide that you were given that has the verses on it on the right-hand side there. You've also got a Bible if, you've, if you brought one or a Bible app, or it'll be on the screen. If you're watching online, you can use your own Bible or follow along on the screen. This is uh, the first four chapters, uh, first four verses of the, of the fourth chapter of Acts. This is what it says. So the priests, the Jewish priests, the captain of the temple guard, and the Sadducees. I'll explain who all those people are in a second. They came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people, and they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. And so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. So just 
tip of the cap to the ladies and children in the room. Listen, um, I don't think the Bible writers were intending to sound patriarchal, which it does a little bit by today's standards. That's how everyone counted crowds back then. And it was just a metric by which you could measure the size of a crowd. And so there were about 5,000 men in this group, then you can probably assume they were anywhere from 15 to 20,000 believing Christians within weeks of the resurrection. Okay? Now these people, these authorities, priests, captain, Sadducees, you can kind of boil it down this way. Priests and Sadducees, pretty much the same guys. The priests were almost entirely Sadducees, and uh, the, the temple guard, you know, the captain guy was, uh, was the, the enforcer. You can imagine he was the captain, right? But the other guys were religious leaders, but they were more than religious leaders. The Sadducees were actually well known in first century Judaism for being sort of the upper crust, kind of secular, liberal, um, cultural overseers of first century Jewish life. They were the intellectual elites of their time. Everybody gives the Pharisees a bad rap. The Pharisees were actually blue-collar guys who worked really hard to know the Bible and to live the right way they knew how to live. The Sadducees were that upper-crust elite group that looked down their noses at all the peasants and simpletons who believed what the, everything the Bible said. They were too smart. They thought they were smarter than the people that wrote the Hebrew Bible, which we call the Old Testament. To them, it was just the Bible. And they didn't believe all the claims made in their Bible. Like, a big one was resurrection. Not the resurrection of an individual, but the Sadducees were known for not believing in the Old Testament promise of the resurrection of the dead, which meant one day, on the last day, the dead who have died in God's favor will, will rise and be made new. That was the promise of the afterlife, or the eschatology of the Jewish faith in the first century. The Sadducees were much too sophisticated to believe such things. You kind of get in a feel for the kind of how the Sadducees were. Like they were, they were much too enlightened to believe what common folk believe. I mean, it's fine if they believe it. If it helps them get through the day, if it helps them to be better people and live better lives, let them believe it. But we know, <laughs> you know, this is, let's have a party and let's just be sophisticated and let's do our thing. And, but nah, that's kind of the spirit of this Sadducee priestly class. And so they were uh, unsettled, to say the least, by the movement of Jesus and its aftermath. What was it specifically that upset them so much that they confronted John uh, and Peter? Well, it's two things, and you see it in the passage uh, that's on the screen. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus, there's the first thing, that guy again, thought we got rid of him, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So we know they didn't believe in silly, you know, backwoods kind of religious hocus pocus like the resurrection of the dead. Um, and, they, uh, and they certainly didn't believe in Jesus. And so um, they, they ended up having John and Peter um, arrested. And this is where things start to heat up a little bit. They are so appalled by John and Peter's teaching in Jesus' name and teaching resurrection that they storm in. They have the captain of the temple guard arrest these two men before they're even done with their sermon. What's remarkable about this is if you can imagine, weeks following this supposed event of the resurrection, um, the momentum is growing. Every time Christian leaders speak out in Jesus' name, they're being dragged off in handcuffs and put in jail. And the movement keeps growing. And this is where things don't start to make sense. And this might be some of the most compelling evidence in favor of the earliest and most important Christian truth claims like the resurrection. Because they, the disciples were not promising people a better life. They weren't promising people comfort or money or prosperity or anything. In fact, they were being dragged off before their sermons were even done. Imagine if before I'm even done today, like, like the cops come in and they storm the stage and they drag me off in chains. And some of you are like, I'm cool with that if that's <laughs> what it takes. I'm hungry, let's go to lunch. 
But imagine if I'm in handcuffs being dragged off the stage, and as I'm going, I'm like, this is the best life ever, you guys. You've got to get you some of this. Like, this is the good life. This is your best life now. Come get it. And then they take me to jail, and it's a scandal, and it's on the news, and I'm embarrassed. But then imagine if the next Sunday, 20,000 people showed up. That doesn't make sense, but that's kind of the thing that was happening with early Christianity. These new converts, these new believers were latching their hearts onto something, and it wasn't directly beneficial to their bottom line. And so what was that? To me, that is remarkable, and it is compelling that 12 disciples became 500 eyewitnesses to the resurrection who became 3,000 new converts at Peter's first sermon in Acts 2 that here have become 20,000 believers who were faithful Jewish people who chose to believe in a crucified Messiah. It made no sense. And I don't think we can just dismiss that a priori like the Sadducees did. I think it should be seriously considered even by skeptics today. Let's move into the next uh, passage here. This is where I left off in Acts 4. This is um, verse 5 through 12. So this is after John and Peter are in prison for one night. And the next day, the rulers, the elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem Annas, the high priest, was there, and Annas was actually the former high priest. He had just um, retired or something like retirement, and he had handed it to Caiaphas, who's here also. Caiaphas was Annas' son-in-law, so they kept it in the family, and Caiaphas was the current high priest, and they had overseen the trial of Jesus. They were named. They were the ones Weeks before, who oversaw the trial of Jesus. Then it named some other guys and their family. And it says, they had Peter and John brought out before them and began to question them. By what power or name did you do this? Talking about the miracle, the guy that they healed. And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. So John and Peter are saying, hey, it wasn't us. (laughs) It wasn't our power. We're We're not magicians or snake oil salesmen. It was by the power of Jesus that this man was healed. And Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which became the cornerstone. This is a quote from a psalm that Peter quotes. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. All right, a lot going on here. First of all, these big wigs, Annas and Caiaphas and the like, they come to deal with this, what they think is mop-up duty, because they already bagged the big kahuna. Jesus is gone, the leader. They cut the head off of the movement. And it's just a matter of time before movements like this scatter and fizzle, and then we move on. That happened all the time around the first century in Judea, all the time. And so they think they're just doing a little bit of, you know, cleanup duty with these guys like John and Peter. John and Peter posed absolutely no threat to Annas and Caiaphas and the like in the Sadducees. No threat. The last time they saw John and Peter, both of them were crying like little kids. Peter was at the trial where Annas and Caiaphas were overseeing it, and he ran away, weeping bitterly, because he didn't even have the courage to admit that he knew Jesus. And that's the last time they'd seen Peter. The last time they saw John was at the cross, where he showed up, and he had his arm around Mary, Mary had his arm around him, and and it was very weepy and very sad, and then Jesus died, and then John walked away, and that was it. No problem. This will be no big deal, these two guys. But something has shifted dramatically shifted in these men, these simple, uneducated men who prior to the book of Acts, prior to the resurrection, were bumbling, young, 
uh, impressionable, impulsive fools who tried at times to speak over Jesus. Peter was always telling Jesus what he should be doing. Like he was anybody to talk to Jesus that way. And John's the one who I mentioned at St. Arnold's who's always talking about how fast he was and how much faster he was than Peter. Like, I'm, I got there first. You know, like John was like, I'm the one he loved. No, I'm the one he loved. You know, like always talking like, like an immature man. And so he, they posed no threat to these mature, sophisticated elites, but something changed. And that story said it, if you were listening, it was very simple. It said Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. And something changed in him to reclaim him and make him into a different man. And I would doubt that because I'm skeptical. I would doubt that phenomenon unless I saw it for myself, which I have too many times to count. This weekend, we're a little shorthanded around here. We've got 20 plus grown men from the story that are serving inside a prison in Texas in Angleton this weekend. Um, it, the ministry is called Jubilee Prison Ministry, and, and this is not what you think. If you think you know what churches do with prison ministry, you are wrong about this. This ministry is not about well-adjusted, law-abiding Christians taking the right religion inside the prison and giving it to those unfortunate criminals on the inside. The reason Jubilee is so transformative for everyone involved, not just those on the inside, but the men who go in from the outside, and the women too, on the women's weekends, the women's Jubilee weekends, the same phenomenon happens. And it's not because we've got the truth and we go deliver it to those poor people in there. How nice. No. It is men and women sitting around a table together, some dressed in plain clothes, some dressed in white jumpsuits, and by the end of the weekend, they've all realized that they are the same. They've all realized, those from the outside went in and realized, we're criminals too, sinners, filthy, deserving of what these people have gotten. We just had parents that loved us and stayed together. We had parents that weren't addicted. We were born on the right side of the tracks. We had an uncle who was a lawyer. That time I got in trouble, I got off. They didn't. That's the only difference here. We're no better. We're sinful. Am I talking too loud? I can't tell. I can't hear myself. Am I? Like, I want you to hear this. There is no difference. They're equal brothers, equal sisters, in Christ, because the Holy Spirit brings conviction. The Holy Spirit convicts us by confronting us with our sin. That's what the Spirit does when he moves. Jesus said in John's Gospel, 16 verse 8, Jesus said, when the Spirit comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. That is to say, he's going to show us, the Holy Spirit will show us that we're no better than anybody else. And the reason why doing anything in Jesus' name and sharing the Gospel at any time, in any place, in history, up to today, has been offensive to so many is that inherent in the teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the reality that every one of us is a sinner in need of grace. In saying that to self-righteous people might as well be hate speech. It's hated now. It was hated then. This is the most dangerous idea that Christianity gives the world. And the Sadducees hated Jesus. for That's what got Jesus in trouble to begin with. That's what they hated most about him is that he called them sinners too. Uh, no, no, we're not like them. Yeah, you are. You're no better than prostitutes, he told the priests. Priests don't like being told they're no better than prostitutes. Preachers don't like being told we're the same as someone who sells their body for money. Like, no, that's not us. I went to seminary. <laughs> that was a joke. Are y'all laughing? Okay. <laughs> and, 
And this, over 2,000 years, hasn't changed very much. In fact, you might say, in terms of the Christian history in America, Christianity has never been so despised. And I don't mean the institutional Christian. I mean the message of Jesus has never been so offensive in America as it is today. Because, and let me preface this part by saying, I love the world we get to live in. I, I would not trade Texas and the United States of America in 2019 with my iPhone for any other time and place in history. I am very happy with the way the world works a lot of the time. But if we're honest, we have to admit that some of the hallmarks of our culture as it stands today are um, self-righteousness. We have mantras like you do you and live your truth and love is love that give permission and empower and embolden all kinds of things that maybe if given further reflection, you would admit they're not ideal for people, but the only sin that really remains in our cultural framework is the sin of pointing out someone's sin. <laughs> you can't do that anymore. Those guys that just left, they're not unhappy. They're getting baptized today. Um, so they're going to go get in their skivvies. <laughs> I don't want you to think they just got up in protest. <laughs> that would be awkward. You probably wouldn't have thought that if I hadn't said anything. <laughs> in a world where it is offensive to say there is right and wrong, the message of Jesus is bound to rub some the wrong way. It was true in the beginning of Christianity, and it is true today. But the truth remains that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, and when he does, he convinces us that my sin is the worst sin, that there is something better for us to strive toward. Now, that phenomenon of uh, offensive gospel is enhanced by this line that came up in this passage we just read that said, there is no other name under which we, or by which we can be saved. No other name. How can Christians in good conscience say such a thing? There is no other name by which people can be saved. To the non-Christian, this has occasionally, often, because of Christian behavior, and how hypocritical and judgmental we can be, to the non-Christian, this has come across as an exclusive club. That it's, it's like, there's no other name, it's us, haha, -ha, sorry, non-Christians, I hope you like it hot, we're going to heaven, <laughs> see you later. Like, that's how people hear that, and we need to know that. But that doesn't mean that's what it means. Because it is not, Christianity, the Christian truth claim, is not exclusive in any way. Every other truth claim I've ever heard is, but the Christian truth claim is not. In fact, there is no other name under which we can be saved, no other name but Jesus, is the most inclusive truth claim ever proclaimed on earth. And to understand why, you have to understand Jesus. And you can't just dismiss him a priori. You have to dig in and understand why he came, for whom he came. The New Testament says that he laid down his life not just for some, but for all. John 3.16 says, for God so loved the Christians, the world, the whole world. If God endured the pain and shame of crucifixion and death, then surely that was enough to cover the debt that was owed for all sin in all times committed by all people. Everyone is already forgiven. Every curse is already lifted. 
Anyone who stands before God condemned, the New Testament says, they've condemned themselves. Anyone who stands before Jesus unforgiven, Paul says there's no condemnation in Christ. And so they're just too self-righteous to realize they were sinners in the first place, in need of forgiveness. Everyone belongs. Everyone is forgiven. This is as inclusive as it gets. But the moment of truth for all of us, the moment of truth is what happens after we come to that realization and accept that truth for ourselves. The Holy Spirit convicts us and it's then, right then, that we have a decision to make. When the Holy Spirit lays your sin before you, you can reject it, you can deny it, you can walk away from it, you can say, I'm a good person. That's not true. Or you can, in humility and contrition, receive the forgiveness that he affords you. The world that we inhabit kind of makes it seem like any time someone tells you you're wrong, or the way you're living is not good for you, it's not God's ideal for you, then it's hate speech, or it's a microaggression of some kind. Um, It's not. It's love. It's real love. The gospel of sin and forgiveness is not about rigid religion. That's what real love looks like. Real love cannot idly abide sin in its midst. Real love always speaks truth to the beloved. Listen, I'm glad that CVS lady diagnosed my bronchitis instead of telling me that I was just exaggerating or that I was okay in spite of my symptoms. She told me I'm sick and gave me medicine that healed me and also did some other things to me. But it's healing me, and I'm grateful. Listen, that's what love is. When God in Jesus Christ always comes to you in love, and he might lay your sins before you, but it's not to shame you. It's not to drive you deeper into the shadows or to pile on. It's to diagnose your disease and to prescribe your pardon and set you free to make you new. It's good news. I'm so glad that when God found me in the Holy Land in 2013, he didn't find me and say, wow, Eric Huffman, you are so good and handsome and smart. Eric Huffman, don't ever change. You do you and live your truth. I'll be right here. I am so grateful that he was honest with me about the messes I was making. Because only by grace could I be made new. Only by the conviction of my soul could I have any hope at all. The reason why living in Jesus' name is always going to be offensive is because to live in Jesus' name is to live proclaiming sin and repentance and resurrection. Jesus calls you to proclaim those things because in spite of how it has been portrayed, that's what we're here to do. That's what love is. Now, some of you have rejected Christianity outright, and I understand a priori Christianity's truth claims beyond the pale. I would suggest to you that maybe that has less to do with the evidence before you than it does with you yourself and your pride, your unwillingness to submit yourself to the Holy Spirit, or your reluctance to join a movement full of people you spent your whole life trying to avoid. And by that, I mean Christians. Like You don't want to hang out with Christians for all eternity. That doesn't sound like fun at all. I understand. I used to say the same things about Christians that you probably say today if you're one of those that's kind of on the fence. Listen, don't let your prejudice and pride get in the way 
of what's real and what you know to be true about God and about love and about yourself. We're gonna have a time of um, baptisms in a moment and after that we'll have communion and during communion, Kale, our campus director for the second campus is gonna be over here at this little baptistry and I will be over here at that one. And if anyone who wants to come and, and um, renew your baptism, if you're already baptized, or if you wanna come and be baptized today, come and see us. Why not? Why not now? Why not today? Make up your mind to receive the grace of Jesus. Let's pray together.